I mean, I long for the day, right, where I never need to mention this ever again because it's all done and dusted one way or another, but tonight is not that day because, of course, I'm speaking of the Rwanda bill. It's been back and forth like I don't know what, and now it's back in the Commons, uh, being voted on pretty much now as we speak. I'll cross live uh, to Westminster where our political editor, Christopher Hope, can bring us up to speed. Good evening, Christopher. Please uh, tell us all what's going on tonight on this one, please. Hi, Michelle. Evening. And great to be on your show. Uh, yeah, the votes have been delayed till 8 o'clock. We had led, led to believe they were at 6 p.m., um, but they have been delayed till 8 o'clock, so they won't come on your show. But there are 10 at attempts by the House of Lords to water down, or they would say improve, the Rwanda bill. Ten measures passed by the peers, which MPs here tonight will try and reverse. Just very briefly, they cover things like making sure the bill is fully compliant with the rule of law which you might expect that to be the case as part of Parliament. But anyway, that, that's one of the measures which the peers have put in there. Also checking that Rwanda is a safe country. That's amendments two and three, and so it goes on. Um, there should be a mechanism uh, which Parliament should be notified on the progress of a treaty um, and others, and, and protections for people who are, um, uh, who, are, who are helped to be allies of the UK who arrive here illegally, should they be sent to Rwanda or to their own country. So there were ten, there were ten uh, amendments made to the Rwanda bill by peers, and tonight the government will seek to reverse those. It's a, it's a process called ping pong, a very boring but it basically means the House of Commons overrules the House of Lords. It goes back to the Lords probably on Wednesday, and then back to the Commons for another vote. And that can happen two or three times before the Lords is likely to fold. And it's unlikely they're going to ask for, uh, they're going to say, no, we are not going to put up with this. That's only on very rare occasions that happens. So um, all part of the democratic process. We do know, though, from number 10, that they are, they are now approaching what they call a cohort um, of um, people who arrived here illegally, informing them they will be sent back to Rwanda on the first flight. How big is that cohort? We don't know. Labour has said it's only, only a few hundred if, if that and if it's that small and it's not working they will, they will axe the Rwanda plan if they become the next government and they've got their own plan to hire as many as a thousand people to help with returns um, and, and, a, and a new deportation um, a unit in the Home Office. So we are getting towards the end of this interminable debate about the Rwanda plan. Fascinating stuff, I say there, with my fingers crossed because I can't wait for the day when it's all done and dusted, Christopher, one way or another. But for now, thank you very much uh, for bringing us up to speed. You look like you're about to spontaneously combust during some of that, Ben Habib. What's the matter with you? Well, I mean, the, you know, the Rwanda plan is not going to work, is it? It, it? it can't make its way through Parliament in, in a manner that makes sense. The idea that the Commons should be directed by the Lords to not break the law when actually it is Parliament that makes the law. Just says it's testimony, I think, to how discombobulated our whole legislature and legal system has become in this country. We simply cannot protect our borders. And we've seen this spectacle of the Rwanda plan. I'm completely with you. I've got my fingers crossed for it just to end. Can we stop talking about the Rwanda plan? Even if it comes in, it's not going to act as a deterrent. It's no deterrent. A few hundred people might go, and according to the Financial Times, today, the cost of the few hundred that might go would be three billion pounds. I mean, we just lost the plot in this country. It's very simple to police our borders. What we have to do is enforce our borders. That's a physical process which takes place at our borders and the prevention of those who wish to enter our country illegally. It's, it's worked for thousands of years and we need to rediscover the political will to protect our borders. I want to come back to you on that, but before I do, uh, I want to bring you in. What's your thoughts on it? Um, I just think the whole, the messaging and the optics of the whole process where he, Rishi Sunak was saying it's meant to be a deterrent, I do agree that it's not going to deter anyone because they've seen that it doesn't Cold water and the idea that if you come here, we'll send you to Rwanda and Rwanda is somehow, quote unquote, a deterrent to people who want to migrate is, first of all, like I've said before, offensive to Rwanda and second of all, not functional. Yeah, I mean, we, had, we did have this conversation before, I remember it. And it's not that people, like you made a good point last time, that actually people have done their best to try and undermine certain countries. And then when it suits people, actually, yeah. they go, look at how wonderful this is. And I know that actually uh, a lot of viewers got in touch about that point. That was and is a good point. But I'll bring you back in, Ben, because this whole notion, like you say, oh, yeah, we just need to protect our borders and all the rest of it. You see, they can't even get a process like this across the line. So all of a sudden, this policing of the border, whether you mean whether it's by armed force, Forces or whoever it is that's going to push, I'm assuming that you mean push back and turn back these birds. Absolutely. But you're not going to get that anywhere near across that line if you can't even get no. something like this. But what, what, what we are seeing is the extinguishing of the 
nation state that is the United Kingdom. A fundamental aspect of being a nation state is territorial integrity. If you can't enforce your borders, you cease to exist as a country. Yeah, but you won't get across the, you won't pass the line. If you can't, if, if the government today can't even get um, across the line, this situation whereby you'd fly people to a safe country uh, to be cared for and yeah. all the rest of it there, then you're not going to get across the line. No, you're you know, not. We're going to stick the Royal Navy in the middle and start pushing these boats You're, you're not going to get people to do it, but that is the correct right thing to be doing. That's what border force is meant to yeah, do. It's not going to happen. No, but, but... Do you concede it's not going to happen? I, mean, I concede it's, it's not going to happen. Policy, I, it's not happen. I concede it's not going to happen, but I will not stop saying it because it is the common sense, sensible, correct thing to be doing. And these people have lost the plot. And those in charge of this country are de deliberately destroying it. And it has to stop. What do you think to all of this at home? Because, you know, I confess, actually, I'm a little bit bored of going around this exact same circle of the Rwanda situation. It's back and it's forward. It's this amendment. That one's overruled and all the rest of it. It is just getting a little bit pathetic now, isn't it? Even for those people that perhaps support this as a deterrent, this whole ridiculousness. Do you ever actually think it is going to cross the line or not? Which is Sunak, by the way. This Rwanda situation, this is some of the least of his worries because, of course, the economy, he's made that's one of his five big pledges. He's been speaking out today. I think I can just have a listen to him, what he has to say. All Conservatives are united in wanting to deliver a brighter future for our country, and that's why we're cutting people's taxes, £900 for a typical person in work. We're increasing the state pension by £900 in just a few weeks. We're in the middle of one of the biggest expansions of free childcare that our country's seen. We're getting the number of boats down by a third last year, tackling illegal migration, and today announcing new numbers of apprenticeships, supporting small businesses, these are all the things that matter to people. If we stick with that plan, I can deliver a brighter future for everyone in our country. Plan, stick with Sunak? I just think that Rishi Sunak is kind of reaching critical mass now, where it's just a, a series of um, lofty rhetoric on the campaign trail. Because like, when they talk about the first 100 days in an administration is where you can be most effective and effectively re leave a legacy by what you make change, how you affect change. At this, at this point in time, what he's talking about only goes to, goes to show that in a country that's suffering um, cost of living crisis, there's problems with the health service, transport, pensions. Where is all the money going to come that you seem to constantly, constantly be pledging? You're saying the economy is turning. At the end of the day, what I will always give Rishi Sunak, he's a numbers man and he's excellent at it. But what you read in numbers means nothing to the everyday man. How does he, how does he feel it tangibly in his functional existence day to day? He's not feeling it there. So what your lofty rhetoric does is just make you come across with a perception of disingenuity. Is that fair, Ben? I think it's entirely fair, with the one exception of your flattering his ability to be numerical. Yes, I, 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 the GDP per capita has gone down every quarter for the last seven quarters. On a per capita basis, we've been in a recession for longer than any other recession since World War II. Um, Rishi Sunak has not got a grip of the, uh, uh, of the economy. And when he talks about our plan is working, all the policies he's delivering are exactly the same policies that were in place before inflation took off. In fact, a lot of the reason inflation took off was because of the policy he, as Chancellor, promoted. And what they needed to do in 2022, when they ousted Boris, was to have a 180-degree U-turn on the policies by which this country is governed, both economically and in virtually all other respects. And what he's done is more of the same. You don't get your way out of a cost of living crisis by going down inexorably the uh, economically emasculating policy that is net zero, which adds about £60 billion per annum to the exchequer's output every year. You don't do it by big state intervention, borrowing, taxing and spending. He talks about taxes being cut, but actually taxes are going up when you take into account the inflationary effect of pulling people, you know, the stealth the tax of drag. pulling people, yeah, fiscal drag, pe pulling people into higher tax bans. Um, this man has got no vision. His idea of steering the economy is to sit there doing nothing different to what's been done before, practicing all the policies that got us into trouble in the first place and hoping that the passage of time will get him out of, uh, out of trouble. Well, well, Judita, there was rumour at the weekend Penny Morden perhaps would be a good suggestion for the next leader of the Tories. Is that an opinion you can get on board with? Um, not, not exactly, but anything would be better than where they are now. But I think, like the point I made, um, one of the times I was, I was on your show 
was the fact that you're dealing with a situation where Rishi Sunak is not an earned leader. He's a leader of circumstance. And now he finds himself having to carry the bag, part of which he's responsible for post-COVID, but also navigate it to a point where you can hand over. But at the same time, you're creating more problems than you are solving because, unfortunately, how do you fix problems that you didn't create completely on your own because you don't know how to navigate your way through them? And that's what he's suffering from. And now you have a lack of confidence within your own party, which makes you look incompetent. Uh, are you still confident in the Tories? I know many of you perhaps will have voted for them. Do you stand by that? Do you uh, look on now and say, yes, it's all going swimmingly or not? Your thoughts on that?